Today we're going to start a series on liquids and solids. We looked at gases in a previous series, and we studied them in, in pretty great depth. There aren't a lot of things about gases to be known that we haven't covered. But liquids and solids are quite a bit more complicated. So we're going to make the few generalizations that we can and then talk about why they are so different from each other. In gases, the interactions between particles don't matter that much. In fact, in the ideal gas assumptions, we're assuming that there are no interactions between particles at all because they move in a straight line, so they're not attracted to each other, and they don't bend their path as they travel. And collisions are perfectly elastic, which means they don't stick to one another at all. But in liquids and solids, the interactions between particles turn out to be extremely important. So we're going to look at the kinds of interactions that exist between atoms and molecules right now. And then we'll deal with ionic substances later on and things that are bonded in ways that we haven't discussed yet. So what are the intermolecular forces, or the IMFs, between particles? They generally fall into three broad categories, but really, they, when it comes down to it, they're all the same. They're attractions between positives and negatives, which you should be getting pretty used to now in chemistry because it seems like that's what causes everything. The first type we're going to look at is simply called dipole-dipole interactions. Remember, a dipole is a molecule that has polarity. So when polar molecules are in the presence of other polar molecules, they tend to line up so that the positive end of one molecule is near the negative end of a neighboring molecule. So in this two-dipole example here, we see the positive end of this one molecule and the negative end of this one molecule form a sort of an attraction for each other because positives are attracted to negatives. But when you have many more particles together, like in this situation, the bonding becomes more complex. The intermolecular forces are more complex, but the same basic forces are still in play. Attractive forces here are shown in red, so this positive is attracted to two negatives, and repulsives are shown in teal, so that these negatives are repelling each other. That complex arrangement of attractions and repulsions causes both the orientation of the particles and the fact that they are globbed together. So a polar substance like, so think about a substance like ether, for example. It's got an O here and then an R on one side and another R on the other side. This is a polar molecule, and both on both sides, the dipole is facing towards the O, and so overall we have a so overall, we have a dipole facing towards the oxygen end of this bent molecule. When two ethers are together, that means this would look kind of like this. Here's R, here's R prime. This end is slightly positive, and this end is slightly negative. And then here would be a neighboring ether. And because this end is slightly negative, it's going to be attracted to the slightly positive end. And that's what holds ether together. A whole complex arrangement of these things, of these ethers, makes ether a liquid. It turns out that the interactions between these things are not all that strong. They're about 1% as strong as a covalent bond. So it's much easier to tear molecules away from each other than it is to tear molecules apart. So if you add some energy to ether, and this will happen just at room temperature, the ether will tear away molecule from molecule, and they'll drift out and become individual molecules, which is what we call a gas. But they'll stay together as long as the temperature is low enough. When temperatures get high, the thermal energy can distort this arrangement and cause them not to hold together. There are some unusually strong dipole-dipole interactions that can occur when two conditions are met. The first thing is you have to have a very polar bond, and typically this means NH, OH, or FH bonds in a substance. And then the other thing you need is a lone pair present on the molecule on the negative end. So an example of this would be ammonia. Ammonia, recall, is a trigonal pyramidal shape like this, and it's got a lone pair up here. This NH bond is pretty polar. So here's a neighboring ammonia up here. The negative end is the nitrogen end. The positive end is the hydrogen end. And so there's a strong attraction between the lone pair and the negative end and the positive H end. Water is a great kind of a classic example of this. Water, recall, is a dipole. The negative end is the oxygen end, and it's got two lone pairs. 
So every water molecule can set up a hydrogen bond, this is called a hydrogen bond, with two other water molecules. And here we see a network of these water molecules. Every And every water molecule, if you zero in on it, has the capacity, at least, to be attached in four spots to four other waters by hydrogen bonding. This means that water has pretty strong intermolecular forces. Hydrogen bonds are typically about five times stronger than ordinary dipole-dipole interactions. And it's because of these very strong bonds that water boils at a much higher temperature than it otherwise would. For a small molecule like this, you'd expect a very low boiling point. In fact, water should be a gas based on its size at normal temperatures. But it's not. It's a liquid because it's held strongly to other particles and the individual water molecules can escape very easily. Of course, if you give it enough energy, as we know, that will happen. Now, there's a sort of a puzzle here for a while because it looks like you need to have polarity in order for there to be any attraction between particles. So that doesn't explain why things like gasoline or motor oil can be a liquid because they have no polarity. Their bonds are all nonpolar. So this guy here, Fritz London, came up with an explanation for that. And these are called London Dispersion Forces, or sometimes for short they're just called LDFs, or sometimes people just shorten it and leave off Fritz's name and just say Dispersion Forces. All of those things mean the same thing. Here's how it works. Remember, electrons are moving around inside of orbitals. That could be in a molecular orbital, or it could be in atomic orbitals, if you're just dealing with an atomic substance. As those electrons move around, at any given time, they might be on one side of the orbital that they're, they're housed in. That sets up what's called an instantaneous dipole. It means it only exists for an instant. But an instantaneous dipole will induce a dipole, it's called an induced dipole, in a neighboring particle. So imagine that I have a helium atom here. It's got two electrons. At any moment in time, those two electrons could find themselves on one side of the 1s orbital. That would create a, not permanent, but a very temporary instantaneous dipole. That means this end is slightly negative and this end is slightly positive. Now, if I've got a helium neighbor here, another helium atom, and its two electrons are floating around anywhere they want to, because this is suddenly positive here and electrons are attracted to positives, those two electrons from this atom are going to zip over here and set up this temporary dipole-dipole interaction. There's no different than a dipole-dipole force, except it doesn't last very long, because as soon as these electrons drift away to another spot, well, this dipole breaks up and it falls apart. So that momentary attraction between those dipoles is the intermolecular force. This is a, another picture of that using uh, electron density clouds. So if you imagine every one of these specks is a likelihood of finding the electron, at any moment in time, they could be both completely nonpolar, like we see here. But if, for some reason, the likelihood of finding the electron shifts to one side, the, elect the two electrons happen to be on one side, that creates this momentary dipole or instantaneous dipole. But because this is slightly positive now, that causes this electron cloud to shift this way, and that creates an induced dipole on the second atom. So now we've got a set of dipoles, just like we saw in the dipole-dipole interactions. And this little attractive force sets up. And then as soon as these electrons drift to a new spot, then it breaks up again. So how is size related to London dispersion force strength? Let's look at some examples and see if we can figure it out. Here are boiling points for four different diatomic halogens. Now, boiling point is a way of measuring how strong the forces are. To make something boil, you have to tear apart the intermolecular forces. So the higher the boiling point, the stronger the forces are. Fluorine is the smallest of these molecules because it's in the second period. Chlorine is the next largest. Bromine is the next largest. And iodine would be the biggest. Do you see a trend? It looks like the larger the particles, the bigger the boiling point, or the stronger the intermolecular forces. Here are noble gases. So these are not molecules, but atoms. Do we see the same trend? The boiling point is steadily getting larger, from negative 268 up to minus 61. The boiling points are all very low. They're all way below zero. 
but they do increase as we go down the column. And as we know, atomic size gets bigger as you go down the column. So why would that be? Well, here's the theory. If I have a little helium and both of its electrons are on one side, I have two electrons that are polarized by only the radius of a helium. Imagine down here a great big radon. If the electrons happen to be on one side of a radon, I can be polarized by the radius of a radon, which is much larger. And so larger particle sizes allow for greater instantaneous polarization. It allows the atoms or molecules to become more polar, and it makes the instantaneous dipole stronger. You might have just as many of them at any given time, but they're stronger for bigger particles. So the rule is larger particles allow greater instantaneous polarization, and so larger particles have stronger London dispersion forces. Here are two molecules of different chain lengths. They're both nonpolar. These are carbon-hydrogen compounds, hydrocarbons. They're both alkanes. How is the strength related to the number of bonds that are present? Again, let's look at examples to try and figure this out. Here are the boiling points for several alkanes. And they go from carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 carbon chains. Look at the boiling points. As we go from no carbon-carbon bonds up to 6 carbons bonded together, the chain length grows and so does the boiling point grow steadily. So it looks like the length of the chain in the molecule is directly related to the boiling point. The longer the chain, the higher the boiling point. Why would that be? Let's go back to the structures and try and figure that out. In propane here, which has only two carbon-carbon bonds and eight carbon-hydrogen bonds, I have a total of ten places where I might have, in these orbitals, an instantaneous dipole get set up. So that means in a neighboring propane, I would have ten places for an induced dipole to get set up. Now, let's take a look at this other particle up here. This is octane. Octane has got seven carbon-carbon bonds, and it's got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 15, 18 carbon-hydrogen bonds. So in total, there are 25 places on this molecule for instantaneous dipoles to get set up. And on a neighboring octane, there are 25 places for an induced dipole to get set up. So even though the attractive forces between individual dipoles are the same in both particles, because there are so many more opportunities in a longer molecule, more of the instantaneous induced dipole pairs will exist at any given time. And that means the intermolecular forces are stronger. Now, even though London dispersion forces are the weakest of all the intermolecular forces, there are some things that are completely nonpolar, and so they exhibit only LDFs that boil at extremely high temperatures. Motor oil would be a good example. Motor oil is, like octane, only much longer, completely nonpolar molecule. So the only intermolecular forces that exist are London dispersion forces. But because the chains are so long, there are so many opportunities for these little temporary dipoles to get set up that in the end you have something that boils at an incredibly high temperature compared with even water that has hydrogen bonding, the strongest of all three intermolecular forces.